I believe that success is getting a reasonable number of the things money will buy. Now, money is not everything, but it's reasonably close to oxygen. I mean, you know, you just kind of got to have some of it. Uh, Admiral Hacker, I've had money, and I haven't had money. I'm here to tell you it is better to have it. Now, generally speaking, the things I like cost money. See, I like to wear nice clothes. It costs money. I like to drive a nice car, live in a nice house. I like to take that beautiful red-headed wife of mine on, uh, on trips and into nice restaurants. It all costs money. I, I like to play golf at the country club. It costs money. I like those things. But I got to tell you, I love the things money won't buy. See, money will buy me a nice house, but it won't buy me a home. Money will buy me a companion, but it won't buy me a friend. Money will buy me a bed, but it won't buy me a good night's sleep. Money will buy me a good time, but it won't buy me peace of mind. I want them all. And I just happen to believe that we can get all of those if we take certain steps and do certain things. I believe, yes, indeed that we can get them all. Zig Ziglar was one of the world's most popular motivational speakers. Ziglar was one of 12 children raised by a widowed mother during the Great Depression. He wrote over 25 books, including See You at the Top, and inspired millions of people around the world. In this exclusive training, Ziglar shares with us the simple steps to drastically improve the quality of life, the importance of hope in achieving goals, and why relationships are the key to success. Special thanks to the Ziegler family for partnering with us to release this exclusive content on our YouTube channel. Enjoy. I'm excited to be here. I read something one time that still fascinates me. I read where every third person is either remarkably handsome <laughs> or incredibly beautiful. Now, what I'd like to get you to do right now is I'd like to get you to look at the person on your left. I mean, no, left. Look them over real good. Real good. Now look directly at the person on your right. Look them over real good, all right? Now, since it ain't either one of them. <laughs> Now, just as a matter of curiosity, how many of you have ever either heard me before or else this will be your first time? Could I, uh, could I see your hands, please? All right, well, you are here. In the next 60 seconds, I will give you a profound thought that can impact your life. In the next 10 minutes, I will give you four thoughts and ideas that can make a significant difference. I'll start with a question. How many of you honestly and sincerely believe? Matter of fact, you're totally convinced that there's something you can specifically do in the next two weeks that would make your personal life, your family life, and your business life worse. Can I see your hands, all right? <clears throat> now, how many of you believe there's something you can specifically do in the next two weeks that would make your personal life, your family life, and your business life all better? Okay. How many of you believe that you have a choice in the matter? Can I see your hand? <laughs> How many of you believe that every choice has an end result? Okay. Now, let me tell you what you have said in a little less than 60 seconds, whether you knew it or not. You have just said, I don't care how bad or good my past has been. I don't care how bad or good my present circumstances are. There's something I can specifically do now that will make my future either better or worse, and the choice is mine. Folks, that's profound. You see, we're not victims. There are things we can do, and we can do them now, that will make a difference not only in our lives, but in our family, in our company, in our community, and ultimately make a difference in America. I'm the tenth of 12 children. I asked my mom one time, I said, Mom, why so many? And she said, well, son, where do you think I should have stopped? <laughs> well, I do. I sure didn't think after number nine. Now, you can, uh, you can absolutely count on that. I was uh, real lucky. I was born in L.A. That's lower Alabama. <laughs> and I was raised in Yazoo City, Mississippi. Now, Yazoo City is not a big place, but it's exciting. About once a month, a train comes through town. 
And that might not sound like excitement until I explain we don't have tracks there, and then that puts it in a, in a different situation. Uh, we don't even have a village drunk. We share with a little community next to us. Now, from time to time, people ask me if I arouse any ire in Yazoo City because of my teasing, and I always say no, and let me tell you why. That little town has produced the former president of the American Medical Association, the former president of the American Bar Association, the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, the former editor of Harper's Magazine, former secretary of agriculture, the current uh, chairman of the Republican Party, a number of distinguished jurists, Jerry Clowers. Now, I don't have any idea what happened to the other four. <laughs> but you see, that little town has been very productive. And uh, if a city is productive, they can take a little teasing. Just as an individual who is productive and self-assured, self-confident, not arrogant, but confident, can also, ladies and gentlemen, take a little teasing. Now, I know most of you just looking at me probably figure I'm in my early 30s. <laughs> but actually, I'm 69. Now, what that means is I was raised during the Depression. We had things kind of tough. Dad died when I was five years old. There were six of us too young to work. It was the heart of the toughest Depression our country has seen in the last 100 years. But, you know, I never looked at the things we did not have. We had clothes to wear, food to eat, and a place to sleep. But what I did notice, and I don't know why I did this, but what I did notice was that there were some people in that little bitty town who were doing quite well. Some of them drove nice cars, wore nice clothes, lived in nice houses. Some of them took nice trips, while some of them even played golf at the country club. You know what I've noticed in every decade of my life uh, since then? I have noticed, ladies and gentlemen, that many people pay no attention to the economy. As you know, the media has accurately predicted 28 of the last two recessions. Uh, so, so they don't pay any attention to it. How many of you have noticed, for example, that sometimes when the economy is just booming, I mean, as we'd say down home, going hog wild, the economy is booming and some people can't find a job or don't find one and even go bankrupt. How many of you have noticed exactly that the same thing happening? I've also noticed when the economy was horrible, I mean, inflation over 20%, rate of interest over 22%, and in the toughest economic times, some people were getting rich. How many of you have seen exactly the same thing? Now, my first point was, there is something you can do now to make your life better or worse, and the choice is yours. The second point I want to make, it's not what happens out there, folks. You can't do a whole lot about that but you can do a great deal about what goes on in your own mind. Uh, in other words, it is up to us to do things with our lives. Now, 300 world-class leaders. See, a lot of people have what we call pity parties. You know, the problem with pity parties is very few people come, and those who do don't bring presents, okay? <laughs> a lot of people say, yeah, but let me tell you about my problems. Well, no, let me tell you about 300 world-class leaders. Now I'm talking about Roosevelt and Churchill. I'm talking about Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. I speak of Clara Barton and Helen Keller and Mother Teresa, 300 world-class leaders. 75% of them were either raised in poverty or had been abused as children or had some serious physical defect. But they understood for point number three, you see, it is not what happens to you, it is how you handle what happens to you that's going to make the difference. Do you respond to life or do you react to life? Respond as positive, react as negative. You get sick, go to the doctor, she gives you a prescription, says, see me tomorrow. You walk in the next day and she shakes her head and says, uh-oh, the prescription's not working, your body is reacting to the prescription, we got to change, you get nervous. But if she smiles and says, hey, it's working, your body is responding to treatment, then you feel pretty good. You believe everything's going to be all right. Now, we can choose to respond or we can choose to react. Thomas Edison, for example, chose to respond. At age 67, his factory burned down, $2 million loss. And in those years, that was a lot of money. He had no insurance. Now, he looked at that and he said, in every tragedy, there is much to be learned. He said, they just burned up all of our mistakes. 
thank God we can start over. <laughs> Three weeks later, they delivered the first phonograph. Responding to life is so important. Now, let me ask you, how many of you will admit that on occasion you get stuck in a serious traffic jam right here in San Antonio at the worst possible time? Can I see your hands, all right? Now, how many of you will be honest enough to admit that sometimes when that happens, you slap the steering wheel, you stomp your foot, you push the horn, you shake your fist, and demand to know, when are they going to do something about it? Oh, how many of you have ever done a thing like that? Can I <laughs> see your hands? Now, I recommend that. I think it's good procedure, and I'll tell you why. I'm certain you notice that when you do that, that the traffic directly in front of you just opens up. <laughs> And permits you to go through. Isn't that what happens? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? All right. Now, if there were a better way to handle a traffic jam, you'd certainly want to know what it was, wouldn't you? Uh, answer is yes, I'll help you with the tough ones, okay? There's no question about it. Well, the next time it happens, not if, but when it happens, what you want to do is try to estimate how long it's going to take you to get through that traffic jam. Uh, and then you say, oh boy, oh boy, it's going to take me 40 minutes to get through. Now, in 40 minutes, I can build my vocabulary by at least two new words. I can learn something about financial management. I can learn two new sales closes. I can learn something about communication. Why, well, I can do those things in 40 minutes. Now, let me give you an interesting fact. Average American spends 500, 500 uh, hours a year in a car. Now, that's a lot of time in a car. You can choose to stomp your foot and shake your fist and raise your blood pressure and be in danger of stroke and heart attack, or you can choose to get an education. In your car, you can learn everything from Chinese art to foreign language to the Bible to investment techniques and management procedures. You can get an investment education right there, or an education, period. It's a choice. You see, the smart people not always are the most successful, but those people who really are organized, who make the right choices, who respond instead of react. Neil Rudenstein is the president of Harvard University, and this is my fourth major point. Neil Rudenstein's mother is a part-time waitress. His father is a prison guard. Doesn't make any difference who your mom and your daddy are, who you are and what you do that's going to make the difference. Now, this presentation is about total success. How do you win the whole ball game? And in order to win the whole ball game, we've got to have a lot of hope. As a matter of fact, that might involve some change. And as you know, change is always stressful, but then so is unemployment. <laughs> and a lot of us are going to be unemployed unless we are willing to make the change. Alfred Adler, the great psychiatrist, said this, change is the foundational quality, or hope is the foundational quality of all change. Hope is the action-oriented word. You see, without hope, the unemployed won't go looking for a job. Without hope, the husband and wife in trouble will not seek counseling and try to save the marriage. Without hope, the youngster will not study for the test because they're not going to pass anyhow, so why go through the routine? Hope is important. My friend Dr. John Maxwell, a leadership expert, says that if there's hope in the future, there's power in the present. Now, hope's got to be fed. It needs fuel. And the fuel of hope is encouragement, and we need that encouragement on a regular, regular basis. Now, if we want to really look at what hope is all about, psychologist C.R. Snyder said, hope is not synonymous with intelligence, nor is it the same as being optimistic. It is more. High hope often assures the person of success in reaching goals. High intelligence may only give a person a chance. What is success anyhow? You know, a lot of people uh, you win the whole ball game. What is success? I believe that success is getting a reasonable number of the things money will buy. Now, money is not everything, but it's reasonably close to oxygen. <laughs> I mean, you know, you just kind of got to have some of it. Uh, Admiral Hacker, I've had money, and I haven't had money. I'm here to tell you it is better to have it. 
Now, generally speaking, the things I like cost money. See, I like to wear nice clothes. It costs money. I like to drive a nice car, live in a nice house. I like to take that beautiful red-headed wife of mine on, uh, on trips and into nice restaurants that all cost money. I, I like to play golf at the country club. It costs money. I like those things. But I got to tell you, I love the things money won't buy. See, money will buy me a nice house, but it won't buy me a home. Money will buy me a companion, but it won't buy me a friend. Money will buy me a bed, but it won't buy me a good night's sleep. Money will buy me a good time, but it won't buy me peace of mind. I want them all. And I just happen to believe that we can get all of those if we take certain steps and do certain things. I believe, yes, indeed, that we can get them all. Let me tell you one of my favorite stories. The gentleman's name is Vince Roberts. 37 years old, how old are you? Drove a taxi, what's your job? He finished the fifth grade, how much education do you have? Now most people would say, well there's a guy who's headed for the relief rolls, eventually the odds are against him. Well one day as he was sitting in his taxi and he did that several hours a day at the airport and at a hotel waiting on a fare, all of a sudden lightning seemed to have struck. He went in a bookstore and bought a book. It was a 20 pound book. Webster's Dictionary. You know why Webster wrote the dictionary? His wife kept asking him, now what does that mean? <laughs> well, anyhow, <laughs> he, uh, he put the dictionary, and I'm glad y'all are having so much fun, you know. We learn faster and we remember longer if we have humor involved in it. And of course, when you really laugh, that's internal jogging that's good for you and it'll save you a bunch of money because the, the new research recently validated uh, proves conclusively that if you have a tendency to laugh, I mean let one go, you know, good old belly laugh, if you have a tendency to do that but suppress it, the laughter comes back inside and spreads your hips. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what that means is you're going to have to buy a new wardrobe, so let's, uh, you know, let's have a little fun along the way. Well, anyhow, Vince Robert bought the dictionary, he set it on the front seat of his taxi, starting on word one, page one, he started learning every word. Now, research at Georgetown Medical School proves that in 100% of the cases, no exception, when your vocabulary goes up, your IQ goes up as well. Uh, suddenly, Vince Robert, before he was an eighth of an inch deep in that dictionary, started understanding things he had only been hearing or reading. He started saving every dime he could get. He invested it in the stock market. He lived frugally. And he ended up buying the 19-car cab company. He's from Ottawa. Now, he kept on investing. Today, he's a wealthy man traveling Canada telling other people how he did it. You see, he wanted some things in life, but he knew what he had to offer life would not provide him what he wanted. It hadn't in 37 years, and he knew he had to grow and to change, and, and that's what I'm talking about. If Vince Robert can do it, and I suspect each one of you, as I was telling this story, I thought to yourself, well, you know, if he can, I can. That's what hope is about. For 24 years of my adult life, by choice, I weighed well over 200 pounds. I say by choice simply because I have never accidentally eaten anything. <laughs> now, <clears throat> if I choose to eat too much, I've chosen to weigh too much. See, every choice has an end result. Now, 23 years ago, I got on a sensible exercise and eating program. Up until then, my idea of exercise simply was to fill the tub, take a bath, pull the plug, and fight the current. I mean, you know, that was it. <clears throat> I needed to lose 37 pounds. It took me 10 months to do it. Now, what that means is I lost an average of one and nine-tenths ounces a day every day for 10 months. See, anybody can do that. I calculated that what I did was give up the equivalent of two big bites of ice cream a day, every day, for 10 months, for a lifetime of incredible benefits. 
Vince Robert gave up some pleasures temporarily for a lifetime of benefits. That's a sign of maturity. But we need to fuel it every day if we really are going to get ahead in life. Now, the reason I believe you can is because of what Emerson said. He said, what lies behind you and what lies before you are tiny matters compared to what lies within you. You will hear me say this many times. You've got to be before you can do, and you've got to do before you can have. Hey there, it's Mark Tim with the Ziegler family, and I sure hope you're enjoying the video from my mentor, the legendary Zig Ziegler. Because you're part of Evan's audience, we want to give you a special bonus. It's a cool little book called The Little Book of Big Quotes, packed with awesome content. This book is free, just for you. Check out the description below, and it's yours. Alrighty, let's get you back to Zig. Now I want to get you excited about life. I believe excited and excitement is enormously important. I believe attitude's important, but attitude as important as it is, is not everything. There's something to go with it. When I was in the seventh grade, as an example, I decided to go out for the boxing team. Now, my opponent, the one we'd be starring, sparring with, was a little guy named Joe Stringer. He weighed 67 and a half pounds. I felt sorry for him. I really did. I mean, I was pretty good on the playground. I weighed him 15 pounds. What I did not realize was that he had been out for the boxing team for the last two years. Now, we got in the squared circle, and it took him about three and a half seconds to discover that the shortest distance to the end of my nose was a straight-lift jab. And he apparently thought I was a slow learner because two seconds later, there it was again, and again, and again, and again. Well, I very quickly decided that I was far too busy to go out for the boxing team anyhow. <laughs> now, understand, I walked in the room, ring, enthusiastic, highly motivated, very positive, and very confident, and I just about got killed. It takes more than positive thinking. Coach Permena had mercy, stopped it at the end of the first round, and took me aside and started my education in the skill of boxing. Now, a week later, I was hitting him on, on occasion. And I'm here to tell you that hit or has more fun than the hit E, that's for sure. <laughs> in two weeks, we were pretty well even, and in three weeks, I was carrying the day because I had the superior weight. In other words, when you take the right attitude and add the skill, whether the skill is in selling or medicine or administration or whatever it is, you combine those two and now you got a winning combination. We're going to look, ladies and gentlemen, at some of the things people want and some of the things that we can do in order to be more successful in life. Now, we start with the fact that we've got to have a character-based philosophy. I'll talk a lot about philosophy. That's the love of wisdom. That basically is what it means. Forum Corporation out of Boston, Massachusetts did a study on 341 salespeople. 173 of them were superstars. 168 of them were good, successful salespeople. Now, if you put the two groups together and looked at their qualifications as far as experience, intelligence, and everything else, they were neck and neck. But one group sold dramatically more than the other group did for two basic reasons. Number one, they had total integrity. When they said something, the customers, the prospect, would absolutely know that is truth. You see, the reality is the only way you build a sales career or a career in the Navy or a career in management or a career anywhere that takes you to the top, according to the Center for Creative Research out of Greensboro, North Carolina, is you've got to build on integrity. Emerson said, if you would lift me up, you must be on higher ground. With integrity, you have nothing to fear because you have nothing to hide. These salespeople had absolute integrity, and they had developed trust. You see, if there's no integrity, ultimately there's no trust. And they were able to build their uh, clients into bigger and bigger clients. Then the second thing that uh, made them significant, and that is they were good people. Common sense, good people. And they understood that the sales process is not complete until the order is signed, the merchandise is delivered and paid for, and the customer is happy. 
Now, they knew in order for those things to happen, they, as an individual salesperson, could not handle it all. They knew they had to to have the cooperation of the shipping department, the finance department, the service department, and other departments in the company. So when they called in, they were just as gracious to the switchboard operator and the filing clerk and the shipping clerk as they were the company executives. Bottom line is, they lived a balanced, happy life, had good relationships at home as well, and were dramatically more successful in uh, everything that they did. Well, the question is, what can hardworking, motivated, enthusiastic people with integrity, what can they expect to get out of life? Well, the reality is all of us want basically the same thing. All of us want to be happy, we want to be healthy, and we want to be at least reasonably prosperous. Now, I know some of you folks watching this want to be unreasonably prosperous. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that's okay. Everybody wants to be secure, and they want to have friends, they want to have peace of mind, good family relationships, and they hope that the future is going to be even better. Now, interestingly enough, uh, hope is on the bottom, because, you see, hope supports all of the others. How many happy people have you ever seen that had no hope? Medical science proves beyond any doubt that your emotional and physical health is directly related to your hope. Your prosperity is tied to it. Your security is tied to it. Your friends are tied to, it, tied to it. How many friends would you have if you walk around looking like a picture on your driver's license? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I mean, when you walk down the hallway, you see, you ought to have that smile on your face. Uh, you know, people will wonder what you're smiling about and let it be kind of a thing between the two of you. We need to look at our personal life, our family life, and uh, our career. Now, USA Today, January 8, 1990, did a study, and here's what they found. Number one cause of a productivity decline in America, marital difficulty at home. Number two is alcohol. Number three are drugs. What happens at home impacts your performance on the job. What happens on the job impacts what you do at home. But the question is, do you respond or do you react? And then we got to look at the physical and the mental and the spiritual. We're tri-dimensional. On the physical, we had a a lady in uh, Dallas, 65 years old, and she uh, watched one of those exercise videos. And you know how excited people get about those things. She was all turned on. She called her family together, children and grandchildren, and announced, I'm going to start walking five miles a day every day for the rest of my life. They say, Grandma, you don't start with five miles. You start with one mile, then go to two, and then to three. She said, nope, going to walk five miles a day every day for the rest of my life. And they couldn't talk her out of it. That lady is now 83 years old, and they don't have a clue as to where she is. <laughs> Your physical condition is important. They did a study, large study, top level executives, 93% of them had extremely high energy. Less than 10% of them smoked. Virtually all of them could tell you their cholesterol level. They took care of their health. They got energetic as a result of it. At age 69, my resting heart rate's 48. My cholesterol level is 162. When I was 68 years old, I stayed on the treadmill at the Cooper Clinic five minutes longer than I had when I was 45 years old and in miserable condition. All it takes is a little bit every day. Now, it takes exercise. It takes eating sensibly. It takes getting a reasonable amount of sleep and avoiding the poisons, tobacco and alcohol and drugs. When I was 62, I stayed on the treadmill longer than any active player in the National Football League who had taken the test, and many of them had. Now, I want to emphasize, I am not an athlete, but I am disciplined, and I am committed, and I do have so many long-range goals. I honestly believe that I'm at least five years, maybe 10, could be 15 years away from hitting my peak. (laughs) I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that we can have a healthy lifestyle 
and it will enable us to extend our career a great deal longer. We need to be growing mentally. Actually, in the last 24 years, I've read an average of three hours a day. Now, I read a wide range of materials. I try to read the Bible every day and the newspaper every day. That way I know what both sides are up to. And, uh, <clears throat> and you know, I think that's important. We really do. Admiral Hacker will tell you, you better know what the other side's doing, uh, friend, because they might have some big guns out there aiming at you, all right? And then, of course, there is the spiritual side of life. You know, we are going to be dead just a whole lot longer then we're going to be alive, so we need, to, uh, uh, we need to look at those things, all right? Now, <clears throat> as, you, uh, as you look at these things that, uh, that everybody wants, what we need to do is examine some of the records and see who accomplishes these things. Can you really get it all? The things money will buy and the things money won't buy. Well, Psychology Today reported on a study done on 1,139 CEOs, average income $356,000. Their number one asset was their integrity. Their number one priority was their family. Look at the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies, April 28, 1986. Here's what they found. 91% of them were either Catholic, Jewish, or Protestant, indicating they were at least semi-active in their faith, meaning they learned their ethics, their morals, and their values out of the Bible or out of church. It seems there is something to the spiritual aspect of life that we really need to look at. Another study was done by uh, Corn Ferry International in conjunction with UCLA School of Management. 1,361 vice presidents were involved, average income $215,000. What they learned was their number one asset was their integrity. Their number one priority was their family. They also revealed that 89% of them had two, three, four, or more children. 92% of them were raised by two-parent families. And they, in 87% of the cases, also were Catholic, Jewish, or Protestant. Putting it all together to win it all, that's what we really need to do. Now, how do you win it all? Well, this is probably going to surprise some of you, but you need to be a good scout and go to church. Now, let me, having said that, let me elaborate just slightly. I was recently re-elected for the third year to the National Board of Advisors for the Boy Scouts of America. I'm telling you, it's a fabulous organization, and they're teaching some things that will make a difference, and I'll reveal in a moment what the difference they're making happens to be. Now, when I say uh, go to church, let me tell you about an article that appeared in the Dallas Morning News, February 12, 1996. This is the study done by the Heritage Foundation. Those who attend regular worship service have a greater reduction of far fewer suicides, less drug and alcohol abuse, crime, out of wedlock births, and divorce. They're far happier and healthier lower rate of depression, higher self-esteem, longer happy marriages, and did you see that one? <laughs> Better sex. Now, folks, I got to tell you, that ain't all bad. <laughs> now, <clears throat> let's take a little deeper look. They said this is what helps inner city youth escape poverty. Those who go to worship service regularly, family income, $37,000 plus. Those who don't go, $24,000. $361 a year. That's quite a difference. Perhaps the most astonishing bit of data they revealed, and I'd be more than happy to send anybody a copy of the article if you'd like to see it, but they discovered that in the inner city, the African-American ladies who go to church, teenage pregnancy is almost completely unknown. Maybe the most startling one even beyond that was this. Almost without exception, the young black males who were imprisoned either never went to church or quit going by the age of 10. Uh, there's got to be something there. And folks, faith and encouragement are two ingredients that you pick up at church. You associate with people of like mind who are excited about life and who have hope in the future. 
Now, those are, and this is the Harris poll that was released in 19, uh, the 1995 study released last year. Of the kids who stay in scouting five years, 98% finish high school. 40% finish college as versus 16% of the general population. 33% of them have incomes of over $50,000 a year as versus 17,000 who do not participate in, I mean, who are in the regular community. 70% of these kids who stay in scouting five years make who's who in America. 72% of the Rhodes Scholars are former Boy Scouts. 11 of the 12 astronauts who walked on the moon, ladies and gentlemen, are former Boy Scouts. Perhaps most significant when these people became adults, 94% of them said the values they learned in scouting is what has made the difference. When I was a Boy Scout in Yazoo City, Mississippi, every Thursday night I used to go down to a scout meeting, you know, and I'd stand up and I would say, on my honor. Isn't that a wonderful word? I will do my best, isn't that a great word? To do my duty to God and country. There are wonderful things there. And then there was a scout law. It said to be obedient and help other people to be clean and reverent. When you put all of those together, you just described a good citizen. You really have. You know what else they teach there? They teach goal setting. You see, I knew exactly what it took for me to be a second-class scout and a first-class scout and a star scout. And, you know, they had court of honor every month, and we would stand up there, and we would be called up front. The parents were there, you know, and they'd say, Look at this guy. Look at what he did. And they'd pin the recognition by your peer group. You know why a lot of kids get in, ga in gangs? Not accepted at home or at school. Here they're recognized in scouting. Things happen, things happen there that are absolutely fabulous. But, you know, you still got to have a philosophy. What is the philosophy if you want to get all eight of those things? It's pretty clear. You can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. Well, Zig, in this dog-eat-dog -dog world where it's every man from it for himself, does that really, really work? Well, I challenge you, pick up a December 8, 1989 issue of the Wall Street Journal. They did a study on uh, golden rule companies. That's what that really is. It's a paraphrase of the golden rule. Here's what they found. Those people make more money. They grow faster and have better return on equity. That's an interesting fact. Treat other people like you want to be treated. When you're talking to your customer, when you go to see your doctor, your mechanic, your lawyer, your grocer, regardless of who you deal with, don't you like to be treated properly? Everybody is in exactly the same shoes. I have the privilege from time to time of doing some work with Chrysler. Four years ago, they came out with a fabulous new model. It demanded that they retool their factories and build some new ones. They asked the workers, what should we do to make a better car and make it easier to assemble and increase our productivity? And the workers said, well, we got some ideas. For example, when we have to work on the underside of the car, if we have to walk down in the pit, sometimes we bump our head. And then we, sometimes we trip and fall. Why not do this? Why not lift the assembly line? That way we can walk underneath the car and work on it in safety. And you know, when we have to lean way over like that, man, sometimes that really is hard on the back. If you would tilt the assembly line our way, it'd be so much easier. They gave the workers what they wanted. Let me tell you what happened. Reduce their medical expenses 90%. Dramatically reduced the amount of time lost because of accident and injury. Productivity skyrocketed. Uh, the quality of their products improved. Profits went up dramatically. The workers were happy. They were made happy first. You can have everything in life you want if you'll just have enough other people get what they want. Then the managers were happy. Then the company was happy. And the stockholders were absolutely ecstatic. Ladies and gentlemen, it absolutely does work, that particular philosophy. One other example. <clears throat> There's a wealthy Chinese businessman named Li Keqing. 
one of the ten richest people in the world. He's from Hong Kong, has an unusual philosophy and applies it this way. He taught his sons, who will soon be taking over the business. They sat in the boardrooms from the time they were five years old. And what he does basically is he finances other businesses. When he finds a good company with good management and good ideas, he will put up the money. And he's always said to his sons, now if 10% is the going rate, but you could get 12%, always take nine. He said 9% of a thriving business will produce more revenue than 12% of one that's struggling for, for survival. But he said there's something even more significant, and that's this. When the business community sees that you're not greedy, that you really do want them to succeed, that you really can't have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want, he said you'll be amazed, but the entire business community with all of the good deals will come to you. Unselfishness is what I'm talking about. And as I begin to wrap up this presentation, let me tell you that relationships are the key to virtually everything we do. Our happiness is dependent upon them. If you're getting along well with the people uh, you love, basically you're pretty happy. If you're not getting along well with the people you love, then basically, almost regardless of what else the rest of your life is doing, you're not a very happy person. I have access to some of the great minds in America in the world of theology, psychology, and physiology. And those who are in psychology and theology do a lot of counseling. They tell me that virtually 100% of the counseling they do is the direct result of relationship difficulties. Husband, wife, parent, child, employer, employee, teacher, student, neighbor, neighbor, brother, sister. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, 80% of the counseling is the direct result, according to Dr. Smiley Blanton, of parents not having taught their children manners. Now, manners is more than how do you hold a knife and fork, it's deportment, it is civility. The child who is never taught to say thank you has never learned gratitude, and you will never see an ungrateful, happy person. We become a self-centered hooray for me to heck with you. I'm going to do it my way. And if I have to win through intimidation, I'm going to look out for number one and I'll do it now. And I've just described a completely miserable human being. Let me explain my philosophy with a little example, a scenario, if you will. And then let's take it from there. And I will leave it up to you if it makes sense that we really should be kind one to another, tenderhearted forgiving each other. In this scenario, it's Friday afternoon. Uh, it's about five o'clock. The husband's been gone all week long. Uh, he comes to the front porch heavily laden with luggage. Uh, he's got a bulging briefcase. He doesn't want to set it all down to ring the doorbell, so he kicks the door. Now, he doesn't gently do it. He does it with enthusiasm and force. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> well, his wife, somewhat startled, comes to the door and opens it and surprised to see him, and he says, the reason I'm late is I've been to a meeting. And I'm glad I went to that meeting because I learned some things that just bug me no end. I learned, for example, that I'm not getting all of my rights around here. And as a matter of fact, I've made a list of all of them. And the first thing you and I are going to do, woman, is we're going to sit down and we're going to go over this list because I'm here to tell you there are going to be some changes made around here. <laughs> I can well imagine her saying, well, Buster, I didn't go to a meeting. I didn't need to. And I don't have a list written down. I didn't need to do that either. You come on in because there got to be some changes made around here. We are going to talk about it. I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to like most of the changes that are going to be made. <laughs> Now, don't you know they had a wonderful, ecstatic, exhilarating, motivating, inspiring weekend? And don't you just know that on Monday morning they couldn't wait to get out there and change the world all for the better because of this rem remarkable, romantic weekend? <laughs> change it just slightly. Same front porch, same husband. This time he's still laden with luggage and a bulging briefcase. He comes to the front door and he gently taps it. His wife responds, and before he makes a move to come in, he says, Sweetheart, I, I'm late because I went to a meeting. 
And I'm ever glad I did, because, you see, I learned some things that bother me a great deal. I learned that in all probability, I have not been meeting the needs which you have. And what I'd like for us to do before we do anything else is I would like for us to sit down. And I want you to tell me how I can become uh, the husband you thought you were getting and you deserve to have when we married. I can well imagine her responding, well, actually, I've been extremely happy being your wife. But from time to time, frankly, I've wondered if I've been meeting if I've been meeting all of your needs, let's do sit down and talk about it. Doesn't need any elaboration, does it? There's nothing else that needs to be said except that you really can have everything in life you want. To watch another amazing Zig Ziglar video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Everybody works on a commission. My secretary, the president of our company, the president of the United States, the truck driver, anybody works on a commission. Even if they have a salary, they're on a commission.